Okay, Proverbs chapter 13. I'm going to start our Bible study with Proverbs chapter 13. This is going to be, I think this is our fourth, right? We've had three so far in this chapter. We didn't get very far last week, only two verses. So let's start where we left off with Proverbs chapter 13, verse 15. And we'll see if we can get a little further, uh, further tonight. Proverbs 13, 15. Good understanding giveth favor, but the way of transgressors is hard. We'll start with that verse tonight. Let's pray first. Father, I pray that you'd bless us as we study your word. Give us wisdom from your book. And, and some of the th verses we're going to look at just give us really, really good, solid principles that once we learn, become aware of them, and we can access them and recall them as we go through life, it'll help us a lot. So bless us, we pray. Uh, and teach us from thy word in Jesus name. Amen. All right, I've preached on this before, so um, good understanding giveth favor. To give favor is a good thing. If you give someone favor, that means they are, okay, in the Bible you find many times people say, if I have found favor in thy sight, or if I have found grace in thy sight, so grace is something that someone gives, offers to someone else when they don't deserve it. If they don't necessarily deserve it. I mean, it's not that they don't deserve it, but it's, 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 it's given as by the free will of the offerer or the giver to give someone grace or give someone favor. For example, I could go through, I could go, you know, I could walk down a hallway someplace or in a, in a store or whatever. I can go about my business. Or I can be aware of someone else coming down the aisle who's a mother with children, and the children are, are hanging on to the, you know, trying to help mommy push, and there's a result, one on each corner, as a result, she needs more room. And I could go about my way and make those kids go around and get behind their mom or whatever, or I can scoot way over and, and just wait for them to pass. That's my option, see? Now, if I have good understanding, and I know what it's like to be a mother, I don't know that I know what it's like to be a mother, but you know what I mean. <laughs> I could put my mind into it, okay, and, uh, and, and, and think, okay, this mother, bless her heart, she's got two little, two young'uns that are hanging on her skirt or whatever, and uh, that's good. They're not running around climbing the shelves. So, so I'm going to understand that that's a good thing, and I'm going to make way for them. That's no time to say, hey, I'm a man. I have a right to half the aisle just like that cart does. No, I, don't, I can be gracious. I can give them favor and look on them with favor, as we all should, a mother with children. Um, because God obviously gave them the grace of life to where they could have children. So why give them a hard time? So if I understand things in a good way, I can give favor. Does that help you understand what this means? So favor is something that you don't, initially owe somebody, but you, you have the opportunity to give or not to give. If you have good understanding, you'll give it. Now, if you have, under, good, if you have good understanding, you can sometimes not give favor to certain people based on how they're living. See? So it's, it's a choice, but a person who does not have good understanding is not going to give favor. He's going to be selfish, self-oriented, thinking about himself only and what he can get out of the situation and what the world owes him and the people ought to respect me, you know. And a lot of people, they, they, they demand everybody respect them. They don't try to earn it, see. So a person with a good understanding will give favor whether people want it or deserve it or not. And uh, so, for example, I think, do we deserve God's favor? We don't, really. But he gives it, doesn't he? So even people that don't deserve it, we ought to, if we have good understanding, we'll give it. For example, you ever notice how, um, I know there's a lot of bad cops, but there are some good cops. And there are some good things, good habits, that police have gotten into, which I respect, as a result of lawsuits. For example, when they arrest somebody and they put them in the, in the, in the patrol car, in the back seat, what do they do? They put their hand on the head make sure they don't bump their head going in. Now, that's a good thing. 
But it can be a bad thing because some people like to lay hands on people's heads and control them and, and do it in a mean way. Well, that's how he does the attitude the police officer has is that's on the heart of that police officer. That's going to be on his conscience between him and God. And, uh, but the fact that they, they're trying to be protective, the fact that a judge can call a criminal Mr. So-and-so and show respect, call him by his father's last name and honor his father, um, that shows respect, see? And that's what people with good understanding can give that kind of favor. And that's the kind of thing we ought to do. Um, so, all right, uh, let's go to the second thing. So good understanding, give a favor. And by the way, what does Jesus say about giving? If you give, and it shall be given unto you. Press down, shaking together, and running over, see? Um, uh, if we, if we, whatever we do, whatever acts we sow, those are the same acts or deeds that we will reap. So, people who transgress the command of God to get understanding, and that is a command, Proverbs chapter 4, verse 7, wisdom is the principal thing, therefore get wisdom. And with all thy getting, get understanding, for wisdom is the principal thing. People who transgress that law, they're not going to have understanding. They're not going to give favor. And as a result, they're not going to receive favors either. See? Uh, quite often when, uh, when I'm traveling, I, it's on a regular basis. This happens to me constantly. That uh, there will be a heavy-duty traffic, really heavy traffic, and I need to get out. You know, sometimes people are just, they're, they're selfish. All they want to do is, they don't want to let anybody in. I have people let me in all the time. Even sometimes when I forgot my blinker and I don't want to get in. <laughs> I forgot that it's on, you know. And people stop and, and, and my wife or somebody will say, hey, someone's letting you in. Oh, I don't want to go over there. So I'll turn my blinker off. And, but I'll wave and say, thank, is a way to say thank you. But people do that all the time. Why? Because when I see someone who needs to get in, who's coming out of a place, I usually stop, not always, but I, I make judgments about people, by the way. If they look like they're really in a hurry and like they're one of these guys that thinks they own the road, well, then I don't give them, I don't give them that favor. I may give them some favor, but uh, I won't necessarily give them that one. But, but usually, usually I let people in. And as a result, I reap what I sow. And uh, so, but those who don't do it and they transgress the law of God, and of course this covers all other transgressions too, the next phrase is very important. The way, in other words, it's a contrast. The way of transgressors is hard. It's a contrast because of the word but. So a good understanding gives favor, but the way of transgressors is hard. Why? Because they don't give favors. Transgressors are people who don't respect God's law. People that don't respect God's law, they are going to not respect other people's persons, property, or their rights. And so, therefore, they're going to be all about their own person, their own property, and their own rights, and not other people's. And so, see, the purpose of self-discipline is so that you do unto others what you would have them do unto you. You want someone to respect your person, your property, and rights. Therefore, if you want that, you better, or we better, respect other people's persons, other people's property, and other people's rights and liberties as well. Because we're going to reap what we sow. So, if we don't, well, we're going to transgress. I'll explain the word transgression. Uh, the root word is grass, um, which I, I like to think it helps me to remember what it means. I think of grass. But it's grass, which means to walk. Okay? Um, so, trans means cross. So, it means to walk across. So, a transgression is a break. The, the, uh, sin is a transgression of the law, the Bible says, Romans. Uh, sin is a transgression of the law. So a law is a line that written down, you cannot, thou shalt not do this. You can do this over here, but thou shalt not do this over here. Like Adam and Eve could eat of every tree in the Garden of Eden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, God said, you shall not eat thereof. So God put a line or a circle around that tree. You don't eat of this. You eat of that, you'll be walking across a line I laid down, a law I gave. 
you walk across that law, that line, lawn, <laughs> the grass, uh, you walk across law and lawn, eh, and grass, yeah, interesting. Um, but anyway, you walk across that line, and you will be a transgressor. So Adam was the first transgressor. Well, actually, Eve was. But Eve could have died. She didn't have seed, so she couldn't produce anybody else. But Adam had seed. So sin entered into the world. See, it just entered into Eve when she sinned. But it entered in the world through Adam. See, because Adam has seed that would then produce more men. So that's how sin got into the world, because Adam transgressed. So, um, but anyway, so the way of transgressor heart, this is a very important principle. If you want to teach your children something, something that's real good to teach, is this principle. You transgress a law or a rule, and life will get hard. See, for example, if you steal someone else's property, you transgress that law that God said, thou shalt not steal. You walk across that line and take something belongs to somebody else, your life's going to get hard. It's going to get hard. You might get away with the first theft, but you're going to think, oh, I got what I wanted, so I'm going to try it again. Eventually, you're going to get caught. You're going to end up in jail. You're going to end up in prison or something, or someone's going to be after you. Somebody's going to knock your teeth out. or <laughs> Your way is going to get hard, see? So when people transgress the law of God or transgress someone else's rights uh, or lines God put around their person, their property, and their rights, then their life's going to get hard, see? A neighbor, for example, who is unkind and mean to everybody around him, doesn't want to be bothered by anybody, and therefore doesn't make friends with anybody, when he needs somebody, he falls down, there's nobody close he can call. His family knows how hard he is and what rough character, and, and so they all move far away. He has nobody to call except 911, and they take a long time. He can't just call his neighbor. He can't, uh, he can't go and ask a favor for somebody. So when you, when, you don't, when you don't give favor, you don't get favor back. And therefore, your way gets hard. With, life is tough. Sometimes we have difficult things happen to us. And you need somebody. You need a friend. You need a brother. The Bible says a brother is born for adversity. Adversity is going to come. And that's when you need a brother. <laughs> uh, whether it be a... a, a uh, blood of man, brother, or blood of Christ, brother, okay? You need a brother. You need somebody. You need a friend. But if you've been transgressing people's rights, properties, and persons in the past, guess what? You're not going to have friends, and your way is going to be hard, see? So learn to get good understanding. Understand this principle and give favors. Let me give you a couple of references. Turn to 1 Samuel chapter 2. Let me give you an example, Okay? Example, 1 Samuel chapter 2 of what I'm talking about. And then we'll move on to the next verse. 1 Samuel chapter 2 and verse 26. 1 Samuel 2, 26. And the child Samuel grew on and was in favor both with the Lord and also with men. Isn't that interesting? Samuel, as a child, who later became the prophet, he grew and was in favor both with the Lord and also with men. Now, it's interesting. Compare that to Luke chapter 2. It's interesting to me. Uh, many times things like this happen in the Bible. You got 1 Samuel chapter 2, and now you got Luke chapter 2. I think it's interesting. Luke chapter 2 and verse 52. It's talking about Jesus. And the Bible says, And Jesus increased in wisdom, and stature. Would you say he's growing? Right. He's growing. He was a baby, but he had to grow. He increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. Isn't that interesting? A prophet in the Old Testament, born of a miracle where God opened up the womb of a woman who could not have children and raised up a prophet to take the place of a prophet who's going liberal, that God would say the same thing about that prophet than what the Bible says about Jesus. They both grew in favor with God and men. They both served God and they served men. So, so it should be your goal, when I, I do my Bible study, I've been doing with Austin, and, uh, and my outline is to develop three antennas, what I call antennas receptives, 
receptors or things that make you receptive to input. There's three antennas we all ought to take good care of and be aware of, keep in good shape so they work. And that is an antenna toward God where we receive the words of God, receive the Holy Spirit rebuking us or re reproving us or convincing us of sin and bringing to our members things that we ought to know. Keep your antenna towards God in good shape. Number two, your antenna towards other men. Input from other people. You know, not to where, where people control you, but where you take the input of other people and you process that biblically. And if someone can show you something that you ought to correct in your life, whether they are aware that they're doing it or not, you know, someone could make a comment. And you say, hmm, I wonder if that means that, and you can, you can interpret that. Holy Spirit can, if your antenna with the Lord is in good shape, He'll help your antenna with men work well to where things that other people say or do or their body language will teach you things. For example, you know, I'm constantly teaching Mark and telling Mark when we go soul winning that 40 years of going soul winning has given me a well-developed antenna where I read people and I understand and I foresee problems or hang-ups that people have when I'm soul winning and I can, uh, run, I can run interference and stop or change something or say something to take away, to drop their, if, they're, if I see if someone's guard coming up, I see it ahead of time. Sometimes no, I know about it ahead of time because I know people in general. And so I'll make statements. You know, I mean, the average, for example, the average person, you know, who wants to talk to someone knocking at their door? All right, what do you want? Salesman or what? You know, they, they're, they're being interrupted. And so I'm friendly. I tell them who I am. I said, just meeting, meet, meeting people, We're not trying to get you to come to church necessarily. And I just want to meet new people. I love people. Now, why do I say that? I said, because I'm just trying to set them at ease. So don't see I'm out trying to sell them or trying to convince them of something right away. Uh, I, just, I just have a, one, one, one important question to ask. And then I ask the question, if you die today, do you know if sure you go to heaven? Or do you have some doubt? Or if you, do you think you have a 50-50 chance or 75-25? What do you, that's, that's all I want, want right now. And uh, so anyway, I, so because I know people don't want to talk about religion and so forth, I have a, I've developed a way to talk to people or, and it's based on understanding, growing in favor with men. See, I can make friends very easily. Because, not because I have a certain personality. I have the personality that doesn't want to bother with people. <laughs> I'd rather be alone. I'd be, rather be a hermit, really. Um, but, uh, I, I have the ability, I've developed the skills of giving favor. Of telling people, I know you probably, you know, Oh, did I wake you up? I am so sorry. If I see someone, they look like they're asleep. I said, did I wake you up? I am so sorry. I apologize ahead of time before they can get mad at me. See, why? I want to win them to Christ. I want them to know that I'm somebody who cares about them. I don't hear not because I care about me or something I'm selling. You see what I'm saying? So that's an understanding that I, I've developed. Good understanding. Give it favor. And uh, so Samuel and Jesus both grew in favor with God and men. So, last thing I want to say about that before we go to the next verse is this. It's something you grow in. It's something you develop. Like a child grows, he develops. See, he gets to a certain age where he starts developing hair in his arms. Okay? That's part of growing and developing. A voice changes and so forth, or at least for guys. So, uh, you want to grow in favor with God and grow in favor with men. And learn how to give favor to other people. And that will help you be a good soul winner someday. All right. Let's go to Proverbs 13. Or I, I'm sorry. Back to Proverbs 13. Let's go to verse 16. Oh, yes. What's your third oh, I'm sorry. The third antenna. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Yeah, third antenna is for yourself. Yes. Be aware of yourself. Be self-aware. Uh, now, there's not, if you don't see something... Um, a lot of times we don't see our own mistakes. So be aware. In other words, be self-conscious. But again, that's not good unless you're a good antenna toward God. The world teaches self-awareness, but for personal aggrandizement and so forth. And that's not good. A person self-aware self can become self-absorbed. So you've got to have three antennas, but it's like the three crosses. One's prominent. <laughs> okay? One should be the center, and it should affect the other two. So... Um, Yes, because a lot of people are oblivious. You know, a lot of people don't know that their breath smells. They're oblivious of their body odor. They're oblivious of 
uh, you know, the other people don't like that they wear dirty clothes, wrinkly clothes, or uh, they don't shine their shoes, you know, things like, be, be aware of that other people might be judging you, and what, how might they judge you that would be negative, that would hinder them from being interested in what you have to say if you were going to witness to them. So that's, that's what I mean by that uh, self antenna for yourself. Um, and it comes from the, where the Bible says to the pastor, it said, take heed to thyself and to the flock or which the Holy Ghost made the overseers. So pastors particularly have to be self-aware, you know, am I stepping on someone's toes unnecessarily? And if the scripture does it, fine, but I should not stomp on someone's toes. I should not say, boy, I'm going to preach such and such because brother so-and-so's here or sister so-and-so. I'm going to let them have it today. No, 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 no. We should just teach the Word of God. Let the Word of God convict so that the shoe, if the shoe fits, it's not because you fashion it to fit somebody. It's they see, wow, that fits me. Hope the pastor doesn't know. <laughs> okay? So it's like somebody came up to me one time, first time they visited here. Um, is the guy that was in the Republic. He came up to me after I preached, and he says, he says, you read my mail, didn't you? <laughs> and I said, what do you mean? I, no. What do, what do you mean? How, I don't know where you get your mail. I've never seen your mail. He said, you read my mail. I mean, you, you know all about me. I mean, all you did is preach about me the whole time. <laughs> and I said, well, no, God knows your mail. <laughs> and uh, he had me preach what you needed, but I had no clue. So uh, anyway, all right. <laughs> Verse 16. All right. Every prudent man dealeth with knowledge. But a fool layeth open his folly. This verse is another good verse that has an implied meaning. So, I'll break it up, but yet they have to do with each other. Every prudent man dealeth with knowledge. It didn't say some prudent man. Why? Because if you don't deal with knowledge, you're not prudent. Okay? So, uh, every prudent man dealeth with knowledge. So if you want to be a prudent, a prudent person, the world doesn't like prudence, uh, so they call it prude. Uh, but I want to be a prude. I don't care what kind of negative connotation the world puts on it. What does that world call a prude? Oh, he doesn't do this, he doesn't smoke, he doesn't drink, he doesn't chew, he doesn't go with girls that do or whatever. Um, you know, he, he, a guy, he's a... He's a He's old fogey, he's out of touch, he's out of date, he's Neanderthal, and they have all kinds of names for people that are trying to live decent. See? So, uh, uh, I was talking to somebody recently, uh, had someone come and visit, and uh, there's a church and, and some groups that are being formed to realize the impact that Hollywood is having on our, on our families in America, so they're trying to produce Christian movies. And uh, so one lady represented wanted to, wanted to talk me into, you know, getting involved with them or, or promoting a screening a, a, a movie or, or go, going to a screening. And, and I told her, I said, yeah, I'm not going to go. And she says, why not? I said, because I don't go to theaters. I'm, I, and to make a long story short, I'm old school. I remember preachers preaching against television, preaching against movies. And so I was taught it was wrong to go to the movies. That's where the worldly people went. So I've never been to movie theater except once, and my dad took us as a family to see a movie called For Pete's Sake, put out by the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association way back in the 70s, 60s, I think. Yeah, 60s. That's the only time I've ever been in a theater to this day. See, Even when uh, Pastor Anderson uh, asked me, or he had someone ask me, um, uh, it was uh, Mark Wittenberg, called me and sent me an email asking me if I would go to Harkins Theater when they're going to have the screening of their film there, the first showing. And uh, it was a private thing, and he said, you can go and you can speak. Well, I told him, no, I, I just go, don't go to movie theaters. Now, maybe it's not necessary to have that standard, but that was a standard back in the old day to separate the dedicated Christians from the, less, from the worldly ones. Now, pretty much, probably, <laughs> I'd say probably 99% of most Christians probably go to movies and theaters. I'm one of those holdouts, you know, and I don't want to break my record, you know. <laughs> I already got once, and I don't want to go again. But you know, maybe the day I'm going, to say, I'm going to realize, you know, maybe it's an opportunity to preach at one of these screenings. And worldly people will come in to watch a movie if it's not at church. And so maybe that's an unnecessary standard. It's certainly not in the Bible necessarily to not go uh, watch a Christian movie in a theater. It's not the building that's evil. So it's the association. It comes to, with me. It's a, it's a habit I developed of, of, of observing the principle of 1 Thessalonians 5, 
what is it, 2017 uh, or 17, I think, maybe 19 or somewhere in there, uh, 16, says abstain from all appearance of evil. I don't go to movie theaters because I don't want anybody to think, oh, he's probably there to watch that R-rated movie or that, would, you know. So I just, I don't want anybody to judge me what I go, what I go in a movie house, so, house for, so I just don't go. Anyway, so we had that conversation. So, so but, but that kind of living would be called being a, a prude. And by the way, I'm not here to judge anybody that does, I'm just because it may be irrelevant nowadays. But, um, but every prudent man deals with knowledge. A prudent man is someone who deals with knowledge. Now, I remember what knowledge is. Knowledge is something we can know is true. Knowledge is different from information, okay? Information may or not be true, see? Did the devil give Eve some new information in the garden? Yeah, he gave her information, but it was false information. Do public schools give out a lot of information to students? Yeah, but is it all true and right? No, see? It's like uh, recently uh, I was with someone who got pulled over by the police and, and uh, that police officer gave us some information and gave us a command that was not based on law. So I challenged him, what law? It's not, it's, there's no law required. He says, yes, there is. You have to do such and such. And I knew I didn't have to, so I refused. And I stood up for what I knew because I deal with what I know and uh, not just information. And eventually that officer stopped uh, pushing that issue because he, I think he knew all along it wasn't right. <laughs> but, uh, uh, but anyway, so there's all kinds of information, but knowledge is what you know is right, and the only thing we can know is right without any doubts is if God says it. Now sometimes natural law will reveal something that is definitely true. I mean, I think, I think we can know without the Bible telling us that 2 plus 2 equals 4. Is that, is that, I mean, anybody argue with that? If you do, I, I don't want to waste my time arguing because you're an idiot, okay? <laughs> so, there, this new math, maybe it equals five because, well, anyway. So, in common core, it might mean something else, but, okay. So, every, so knowledge is what God tells us we can know is true because God's the author of it. And, by the way, that's why natural things, God's the author of all nature. So, still, Knowledge is what you can know from God. Even the invisible things of, of, of nature tell us things. So, every prudent man deals with the knowledge. Prudent people get to know the Word of God. They learn what they know is true because God said it. And if we're prudent and wise, we will read and study and learn the Word of God so we can know what is true, know what is right. That's, that's why, for example, or talk about uh, Shemitah. I'm not all excited about Shemitah and thinking, oh, the world's coming to the end of the 23rd or everything's coming together. To, this is to, that's today. I haven't heard anything bad yet. See? But boy, a lot of those videos on YouTube are going to be you know, no good. <laughs> They're going to be pointless. They're going to be mute points. That reminds me years ago, I think I've told this, but I'll, it won't hurt to tell it. Reminds me years ago, when I was in Bible college, our pastor was doing a question and answer time with the preacher boys, those that were uh, studying to become pastors and so forth. And somebody asked him, they said, they said Pastor, how, how, um, how much emphasis should we put in our ministries on prophecy? And this is Dr. Hiles. And so Brother Hiles said, well, it's a good question. You know, prophecy is very important, obviously, and you need to teach it. And he says, but be careful. I've got, he says, for example, I've got a whole bunch of sermons I've preached in the past about Jesus coming that they're useless. A lot of preachers thought that Hitler was the Antichrist. A lot of pe pope people thought that Pope Paul VI, you know, back in the 60s or 70s, was the Antichrist. And boy, all kinds of books were written about it. And oh, yeah, he, or, or not the Antichrist, he's the false prophet and somebody else is going to be the Antichrist. Anyway, there's all kinds of stuff out there. Now, he said, he said, so let me give you some advice. Preach the truths, preach the gospel, preach the truths of the word of God, teach prophecy, but be careful about trying to say when something's going to happen if the Bible doesn't say it. Be careful about how you interpret prophecy. Otherwise, you're going to be like me. I've got 
I've got loads and loads of sermons you can have for nickel apiece because they're absolutely worthless to me. <laughs> or I preach that something such is going to happen, and then it didn't happen. So be recovered. So I, I, I remember that, and so I'm very prudent in that I just deal with knowledge. And if I can't know it, I don't deal with it. I deal with what I know. See, I don't know when Jesus is coming, but I know he's coming. See, so, um, and I don't know who the Antichrist is, but the day will be come when I will know. I'll deal with it then. In the meantime, I have a command, occupy till he comes. That I know, Jesus said, and therefore that is what I'm going to do. I'm not going to say, oh, if so is the Antichrist, then we better start preparing, we better hide, we better protect ourselves. Like I said, I have general things that I have done to protect myself just because I'm prudent. I have the knowledge that things are going to happen someday that might be bad. They have in the past. They might in my life. I don't know that I'll go through it. My, you know, I've had a lot of relatives. My pastor, for example, he went to heaven. He didn't have to see the things that we're going to see. He hadn't seen the America. He thought America's bad enough. I remember he preached on a sermon called It's Midnight. Or it's, uh, or it's Midnight. Or it's getting close to midnight. Where everything's culminating. Boy, the hour is getting dark. And, and man, Jesus must be coming soon because of this and this and this. And I remember he preached about the alignment of the nations for the attack on Israel and so forth. And, and, and I remember all that. And I remember listening to it one day. I said, wait a minute. He misunderstands such and such. <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and of course, he knows now. But anyway... So we've got, we got to be careful. Let's deal with knowledge. Every prudent man deals with knowledge. So find out what you can know without a doubt, not that which is ambiguous or, you know, or, or you're not sure of. Look, I, I've told you many times, and I'm not going to rehash it. There's many times in, in my lifetime when I was unsure what the Bible meant by a certain passage. There's still some. There's still parts of the Bible I do not understand. Um, so far, no one's asked me about them, but, <laughs> uh, but I've, got, I've got places marked in, in my margin here where I put brackets through a passage of list of verses, and I have the word study next to it. I have that in several places. Some of those, I can probably go in and block that out because I've studied, but some of them I've not gotten to yet. So, but I deal with knowledge. Now, what's the flip side? But a fool layeth open his folly. A fool layeth open his folly. Now, what does it mean to lay open your folly? Okay, folly means uh, foolishness. Okay, it's, it's a, a word that comes from the word foolishness. If someone is involved in foolishness, it is folly for him to do whatever that he's involved in. Okay, so it's relate, related. So a fool layeth open his folly. In other words, he's going to be involved in foolishness. It's going to be open and public and Every, you know, a lot of people are going to know. He's going to lay it open where anybody who happens to walk by is going to, oh, wow, that guy did that. So, uh, for example, what if a guy were to think the end of the world is coming or that uh, Antichrist is coming or that the uh, U.S. government is going to collapse and everything's going to fall apart, there's going to be riots, and he starts erecting barricades in his yard <laughs> and setting up, you know, uh, uh, building domed turrets with with place where he can shoot guns out either wide enough we can have a machine gun in there what if he has those on his front yard and his backyard and then nothing happens everybody in the neighbor's gonna talk oh yeah that's that guy that thought a couple years ago that everything's gonna fall apart yeah he's got these turrets he's got underground tunnels that guy's kind of goofy and crazy now because he doesn't deal with knowledge but he becomes a victim of of circumstantial evidence which is not always does not always tell the truth, okay? Um, so, he, his folly that he over-prepared is going to be open for everybody to see. Is that a good enough illustration to understand? Now, so, so the, the, the phrases go together because there's just a column between it. Every man prud dealeth, every prudent man dealeth with knowledge, but a fool layeth open his folly. So a fool is not a prudent man. And also a fool fool does not deal with knowledge. He deals with feelings. He deals with uh, what's hip, what's cool, what's in, what's... Uh, he deals with uh, stimulus. Why? Well, that's the way fools are. Fools live their lives based on stimuli instead of based on knowledge. See, I have known Christians that, that uh, 
Boy, it doesn't... Okay, let me give you a biblical example. Paul warns, he warns people against being, being fooled by every wind of doctrine. You know what that means? Okay, what is wind? Basically moving air, right? A moving of air. And uh, air, the root word, the Greek word for air is pneuma. And, uh, and so uh, pneuma is also the, word where we, is the Greek word where we get the word spirit and ghost in the Bible, like Holy Ghost and the Holy Spirit. It's pneuma, the Greek word. So it means air. So, but there's a Holy Spirit and then there's an evil spirit. Both are like a wind. They both try to influence, you know, you can't see the wind, but you can s feel its effect. You can see its effect on people and on things. And so the Holy Spirit, you can see him working in some people's lives. And you can also see the evil spirit or Satan uh, or one of his cohorts working in people's lives. I see Satan working in government, see. I see Satan working in our culture. I see Satan, uh, evil spirits, working in our public school system. I see evil spirits working in churches, even Baptist churches, even independent fundamental Baptist churches. And I've even seen it working in these pews. I've even seen him working in my office. <laughs> now cast him out, okay? So, but, so we have to learn to see the effect of the wind. So the Bible talks about every, people being tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. There's some people, as soon as a new doctrine hits, boy, they, oh, they ride the wave. You know what I'm saying? They surf. There's a lot of Christians just nothing but serving. They, they find out what's hot, what's cool, what's in, and boy, they go with that. You know, a new movement, new kind of church being started. Oh, we're having cell groups, or oh, we're having a, a Bible studies in the home, and, and we'll call it a church, and, and uh, who needs a building, and so forth. And by the way, there is nothing wrong with that, biblically, but you've got to do things biblically. You've got to have a God-called preacher and a God-called pastor that God said, I will give you pastors. He, said, he didn't say, I'll make all of you pastors. He said, I'll give you pastors. And uh, so a lot of people start churches, just get a bunch of people getting together, having Bible study. Okay, we're going to call this the church of, church of Home Bible Study. And, but there's no pastor, there's nobody in charge, nobody called of God. It's not a church. And so, so, but people fall for that because they fall for every wind. They don't notice whether that wind is holy or unholy. See, it's a wind. There's a spirit moving, but it's not a moving of the Holy Spirit. So, so a... Every prudent man deal with his knowledge, but a fool who does not deal with knowledge lives by impulse, stimulus, what's cool, what's, you know, what's respectable, what's politically correct, etc. He's going to do things on that basis, and guess what? His folly will be laid open someday. Wow. You ever notice, you ever talk to somebody and ask them, Hey, got any pictures when you're young? Oh yeah, I got some pictures when I was in the in the seventies. Oh, but I, no, I'm embarrassed. That was I can't believe I dressed that way. Why did they dress that way? Why did they do their hair that way? Why did they? Because it was cool. It was in. It was the fad. It was the trend. See, so wise people, prudent people, live their lives because of biblical principle, not because of Hollywood, or because of Paris, or any other worldly influence. Okay? So, otherwise, that's going to become passe, because all things that are not of God pass away. That which is of God, God is, endures forever. Whatsoever God doeth, it shall be forever. And decency and right <coughs> will, always, will always be good. <coughs> decency and right <coughs> will always be good among good people. But evil is going to go from this trend to this trend to this trend to this trend. See? All right, let's go to the next verse. Verse 17. <clears throat> a wicked messenger falleth into mischief, <clears throat> but a faithful ambassador is health. Notice, notice right away, these, some, some verses are absolute contrasts. Okay, you have a messenger in the first half, and <clears throat> you have an ambassador in the second half. Aren't those somewhat similar? A messenger and an ambassador? They're very similar. An ambassador in, in you know, U.S. ambassador some country is going to give messages to the head of state of that country from our head of state. 
So, um, so you have a wicked messenger in the first part, and you have a faithful ambassador in the second part. But, uh, or you have a messenger in the first part, ambassador in the first part. But God deals with a wicked messenger and contrasts that with a faithful ambassador, an ambassador that is full of faith. Okay? Now, a wicked messenger falleth into mischief. Because he's wicked, he's not going to follow biblical principles, which means he might give a message that's not true. He might give a false message. See? And therefore, if you give a false message, guess what? There's going to be people who, who don't like it that they've been lied to. When they find out, then the wicked messenger is going to fall into mischief. Mischief is just going to happen to him. All right? But a faithful ambassador is health. Doesn't say is in health, but is health. Notice the faithful ambassador is going to bring health to the people he gives his message to. See? So that's why I want, my goal is to be faithful to the Word of God, be prudent, and to deal with knowledge. So as an ambassador of God, that I am health to you. Your life will be better. You'll have better mental health. You'll have better emotional health. You'll have better physical health. You'll have better spiritual help or health because of the things that you learn here at 35th Avenue Baptist Church. Because, I want to be, because of my faithfulness to God in dealing with knowledge and being an ambassador of Him, that is faithful to him. Okay? So, but a, a boy, a wicked, a wicked messenger, a guy who preaches something because it'll get a crowd, and people later on find out that's not even true, that guy's going to fall into mischief. You just, if we just relate it to preachers, preachers who do not preach the truth are going to fall into mischief. Preacher begins to uh, hedge on what's right and what's wrong. And change things. And, uh, and go blatantly against the gospel, against the word of God. They're going to fall into mischief. You see. So, alright. Let's go to verse 18. You can at least get a, one verse more done than last week. Poverty and shame shall be to him that refuseth instruction. But he that regardeth reproof shall be honored. So two things are going to happen to, to him that refuses that instruction. If a person refuses to let someone put structure in them by teaching them biblical principles, they don't have structure and they're just kind of like an amoeba, just, oh, I, just, I do whatever I feel like doing. and eh, Whatever the wind blows. No, pe people who live by principle don't ever do that. They look at what the Bible says is right and that's how they live. Live by principle, see. A lot of people go through, oh, I just, got, I just don't know what to do, so I'm just, well, I'm just going to go eeny, meeny, miny, mo. If you don't know what to do, it's because you don't know the Bible. The Bible will give you, you don't know the Bible very well. And by the way, what, there's nothing wrong with not knowing what to do, because none of us know all of it. But that's why the Bible says, a, why, a prudent man um, is going to go to the wise and get counsel, see. If you don't know what to do, Find someone who you think that you respect their knowledge of the Word of God and go to them and say, do you think you can give me some insight on this? Don't go and say, you know, here, uh, I give you veto of power of my life and whatever you say I'm going to do. No, don't ever do that to anybody. Um, you, you, I, now, I recommend giving someone the, 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 the opportunity, the freedom or the liberty to say, hey, if you think something's not right that you see me doing, by all means, tell me. But... Don't ever give anybody full authority over your life. Otherwise, why would God give you free will? He wants you to exercise your free will, exercise your judgment. But there's nothing wrong with getting counsel. And then weighing, hearing that counsel and seeing if it, you know, do your due diligence, search the scriptures, see if those things are so. And if they are, then you decide because the scripture says no, not because brother so-and-so said so. See, I'm all for pastoral counseling. I think it's... God says, I will give you pastures, shall feed you with knowledge and understanding. 
But the reason, I, the, the reason I preach and teach the way I do is to get, the reason God wants me to preach and wants preachers to preach the way he wants them to preach is so that you'll have understanding. And when you have understanding, you know what you're standing on because you know what's underneath it. You know the foundation you're on. You can know the principles. And you don't have to go to the preacher every time because you learn a principle. And then the principle makes your decision for you. You don't have to go, you know. I, I know people that used to go, uh, in Bible college, they'd go to Pastor Brother Howes and say, Brother Howes, uh, here's the situation, and I want, want your advice, and uh, whatever you say I ought to do, I'll do, because I trust you as my pastor. I remember one time Brother Howes said, didn't you just bring up something very similar to this before? Why, you, why can't you make your own decision based on principles that I've taught you? One time I went to Brother Howes for counsel, and he said, I just preached on that last Wednesday. Weren't you listening? <laughs> Ouch, ouch. <laughs> I walked out of the door standing up <laughs> without opening it. I felt so small. No, I didn't. That's just a, a saying. But, but no, but he, point, he taught me something that I was there and I missed it. So I started listening more intently so I don't miss wisdom that he teaches. Because he wasn't wanting to control people's lives. Some people think he did, but no, he wasn't wanting to control. He wanted to help people. And some people are too stupid. They want they, they, you know, I don't want to be your nanny, okay? I really, I don't want to burp you. Now, if you need burping, I'll do it, okay? But grow up and learn how to burp yourself or learn how to eat and keep your food down. Learn how to digest the Word of God. Learn how to study it. Learn how to listen and get something out of church. I shouldn't have to burp you, okay? But some people, oh, they feel important if they can go to the pastor about everything. Well, you are important. I think I tell you that enough. You're important. God made you in His image. God's given you free will. I want to help you, but I don't want you to become helpless. I don't believe in welfare, okay? I believe in faring well, but I don't believe in welfare where people always go to somebody for the same thing over and over and over. No, no, no. I'd rather teach you how to fish than to give you a fish every day. Because then you can feed yourself. If I teach, if I give you fish, I can only feed you for a day. But if I teach you how to fish, I can help feed you the rest of your life, provided you fish. So, a lot of my preaching and teaching is to show you how to glean biblical principles. See, like the way of transgress art. Don't transgress God's laws. Find out before you do something. Is there anything against, the Bible says against this? And if there is, then don't do it. Then you don't have to call me up and say, Pastor, what do you think if I do such this? If you learn that principle and you learn God's word, you can make the decision yourself if you don't want to be a transgressor. All right? You with me on that? Okay. So, uh, we got to quit here. Poverty and shame shall be to him that refuses the instruction. So, don't refuse instruction. Let, in fact, preaching and teaching here at 35th Avenue Baptist Church is designed to instruct you, put structure in you so you have the wherewithal, the framework to make decisions and to live for God, not just be a follower of me. See, I want you to follow me until you can learn to follow the Lord better on your own. But I don't want you to be a follower of me so that I can have a, follow, a follower. No. Um, I, I want to lead you into, help, help lead you, but only so that you can get to the place where you can then take care of yourself. And that doesn't mean don't go to church. That just means... You have good principles. The reason we come to church is we can unite together and, and work together and accomplish things and have numbers and we can get more accomplished. All right. Poverty and shame shall be to him that refuseth instruction. So people that refuse instruction, they have shame and they have po 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 shame and poverty. They'll be poor. But on the contrast, he that regardeth reproof. Regard means to, means to guard again or go back because you're, you're wanting to guard yourself from making mistakes, so you go back and revisit things and make sure, you know, see, did I make the right decision? And you regard, you, you don't regard so much your decision, you regard reproof. If someone has given you reproof, you regard that, you give it a second look, you, get, you respect it, and you, you go back and think, should I give that some, some weight? So, so he that regardeth reproof shall be honored. Why? Because you're going to make decisions that people are going to honor you. You say, boy, that guy, he's, look, he's, 
Look what he's done with his life. Now, why are people where, where they are in their life? The main reason they're where they are in life is because of the decision they've made in the past. So if you, make, if you don't refuse instruction and you regard reproof, you're going to make better decisions than if you, didn't refu than if you uh, did refuse instruction and didn't regard reproof. And so when you make better decisions, you're going to have a better life and people are going to honor you for what you've done with your life. Does that make sense? Okay. All right. Let's stop there. All right, let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Well, wow, a lot of good things were said tonight. A lot of good things shown from your word. I pray, Lord, you'd give us the ability to glean from your word principles that we can carry with us, that we can remember, or at least that we listen so intently that, that your spirit can bring them to our remembrance when we need them. And you, and you do so because you know that right now we're respecting it and we value it and we're listening carefully. I pray that you bless our people with that ability uh, to remember uh, your principles and to be sensitive to your spirit so that you, they will enable you and not hinder you and grieve you to where you don't bring to their members things that they need. So bless us, we pray, through these scriptures tonight. In Jesus' name, amen.